West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Tim Booth is a police officer for the Air Force in Kansas. He's got six kids under the age of 15, and like many Americans, he lives paycheck to paycheck. So as the nation hurdles toward a federal government shutdown that would halt pay to its 4 million employees, Booth, who's also a veteran, is trying to figure out what he's going to do at the end of this month. He told NBC News this, quote, You take away a paycheck? How am I going to live for the next two weeks? How can I take care of my kids? How am I going to take care of my wife? And that type of mindset ends up causing bad things to go through some people's minds. And some people can't get through it. If that makes you feel mad or sad, just wait, because it actually gets worse. While House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and his merry band of Me First misfits in the Republican Party, who will, of course, continue to get paid, by the way, flail about in budget negotiations, they're making very clear what their actual priorities are. Tomorrow, the GOP-controlled House Oversight Committee will convene for its first impeachment inquiry hearing. And by the way, none of the witnesses slated to testify appear to have any direct knowledge of what House Republicans have alleged about President Joe Biden. Let's bring in Democratic Congressman Daniel Goldman of New York, joining us now from the Capitol. Claire and Andrew are with us. Congressman, I wonder if you want to yield your time to all the Republican members who have said we have no evidence, zero, zilch, nada. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I I mean, it's pretty remarkable that uh, we are where we are, and it's very telling that the very first hearing of this so-called impeachment inquiry is with a bunch of people who have no knowledge, as you say, no direct knowledge, no fact, factual knowledge of any of the allegations. And, and that's largely because there is no factual evidence to support an impeachment inquiry, uh, which is the reason why the the speaker did not have a vote uh, to go forward with impeachment, even though he said he would. And that's because there are a number of Republicans who have gone public to say that the evidence is not there linking Joe Biden to any wrongdoing. And yet here we are, 48 hours from a government shutdown, moving forward with an impeachment inquiry. Congressman, what is the appropriate response and what advice do you have for how we talk about it or or cover it? It seems that they may benefit from recent muscle memory of how the very legitimate impeachments of Donald Trump were covered and handled. Right. I, I mean, look, I think it's very clear what we have going on here. There is a mob boss down in Mar a Lago who is directing his soldiers in the House of Representatives on the Republican side to both move forward with an impeachment inquiry as retribution for those uh, that Donald Trump suffered from, or endured, I should say, uh, and the four criminal indictments, 
and also that he wants to shut down the government. And you have Marjorie Taylor Greene, who linked those two things together, and the extreme MAGA wing of the Republican Party acting at the behest and direction of their boss, Donald Trump, is leading us down a horrific path of a sham impeachment and a government shutdown uh, that is not what either what the American people want. Congressman, I'm curious, um, from where you sit, it appears from where I sit that Kevin McCarthy is the worst negotiator in the history of Washington politics. I have never before seen someone give the other side what they want before there's ever any negotiation. And that's what this stupid impeachment inquiry is. It was a fig leaf to try to paper over the fact that he's got a group of people that don't want him to be speaker anymore. Um, they just don't want him to be speaker anymore. And he can't open the, keep the government open without Democratic votes. I think that's pretty clear. So how's this end? Is, is, are we going to be calling somebody else speaker before we're saying trick or treat? Look, I think there's a lot that remains to be seen. And as uh, Leader Jeffrey said earlier today, you know, we stand ready to pass the Senate continuing resolution that they are going to put forward. The Democrats in the House support that. We do not want a shutdown. We do not think a shutdown is justified. We do not want that gentleman that you quoted at the beginning of this segment to have to endure exactly what he described. And the preposterous posture that the Republicans have here by not only leading us into a shutdown, because remember, Claire, and you know this, all the bills that they are working on right now do nothing to prevent a shutdown. First of all, they'll never pass muster in the Senate. Uh, they may not even pass the House. And even if they did, they would not provide funding past Saturday. So it's all just a game. Uh, it seems for the few hard right hardliners who have the speaker in a vice and can just continue to turn it and turn it. And he refuses to stand up to them. And so now we have this parallel tracks of this absurd impeachment inquiry and going into a government shutdown is even made more preposterous by the fact that uh, Chairman Comer has said that the impeachment staff are essential employees. So they will get paid and they will go forward with the impeachment inquiry while gentlemen like the one you referenced earlier will not get their paychecks, as will hundreds of thousands of other federal workers. It is a sad, sad state of affairs. And I don't know what the way out of it is unless Speaker McCarthy is willing to partner with Democrats and the Senate in order to pass a very reasonable continuing resolution that the Senate is uh, putting forward. Congressman Goldman, I was wondering um, if you um, heard our last segment, we were busy talking about the sort of increased um, rhetoric about violence and the threats of violence that are going on in this country. Obviously, we all lived through January 6th, but just the rhetoric coming from the former president and the actual instances of violence that we're seeing. And now we're seeing it with respect to not just the election workers, Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, with respect to threats to judges, prosecutors, um, jurors needing to be protected, family members. And I was wondering if you thought there was anything that people in Congress could do. They're obviously in, in connection with the impeachment. You're seeing some um, rational Republicans peel off from this. Is there any chance for there to be any sort of condemnation in a bipartisan way for um, trying to tone this down before we see essentially you know, some some really horrific action occurring. Yeah. And Andrew, you, as you well know from your organized crime prosecution days, these are the tactics of a mob boss. And I was so struck by the excerpt in The Atlantic of Mitt Romney's book where he said that he had Republicans tell him that they changed their vote because they were afraid for their families. And if we are living in a, a Congress right now where people are voting to avoid threats of violence and potential violence stirred up by one man down at Mar-a-Lago, we're in a really dangerous place. And the only way for that to stop is for the extreme MAGA Republicans who are aligned with Donald Trump to stand up to him and to say, this is not okay. And the chances of that happening are, well, pretty slim.
It is Thursday, the 28th of September of 2023, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious, the little Yorkie, is our door girl. And she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Mm -hmm. Well, it uh, looks like the impeachment inquiry is off to a fabulous start. Very first item on their list is wrong. <laughs> what? I, I, I'm, I, I'm only laughing in a cynical, uh, shall we say, defeatist way, because what the hell can we do? Unbelievable. Everything is predicated upon a lie, and the truth is somehow denigrated as being alt-left. You're an alt-left lunatic! How many times have I heard that before? Well, not so much the alt-left, but I love how the alt-left is a total Trumpian trope. But, hey. Yep. Yeah, it was in response to the alt-right, which is what the Charleston Nazis decided to call themselves. Uh, we we coined them dapper Nazis because they were, were wearing khakis and polo shirts. And they said, they're calling us Nazis, and Nazis doesn't track too well. Let's call ourselves the alt-right. So, of course, uh, many in the media decided, instead of calling them Nazis, called them alt-right. And then Donald Trump said, but there's, there's good people. Good people on both sides. What about the alt-left? What? And I guess the alt-left is loosely defined as pretty much anything that's anti-fascist. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, they say extreme anti-fascist. Now, my argument is, how? what, what do you mean <laughs> extreme anti-fascism? There's no such thing. How can you be an extreme anti-fascist? You're either an anti-fascist or you're not. There's no graduate, you know, gradient of it. <sighs> so I don't know. I know what they mean. They see black block. They see anarchists and they go, that's Antifa. Is it? <laughs> Because I don't know. I don't think so. Especially Black Bloc, which is notorious for you know, having a bunch of Asian provocateurs on, well, shall we say, the right wing side. Stirring things up. And then blaming this amorphous group as leftist. Antifa. Uh, that's Black Bloc. Okay? Do not confuse whatever Antifa is. And whatever Black Block is. But they like the image of Black Block because it's, and it looks scary. Which is, then begs the question, why do these types on that side feel so homey with the Eamon Bundy types? I look at Eamon Bundy, I'm all like, man, that's a, that's a thug. I mean, come on, put a hoodie on that guy and see what happens. They'll change the Senate rules for being able to wear a hoodie then. That's what is what would happen. Did you can you believe that? Unanimous. The vote to make Fetterman wear a suit was unanimous. Whoa. The Dems are gonna be quizzlings? No. Not even on the most idiotic measures. Give me a break. Oh, we have to have bipartisan consensus. Yeah, well, you know what? Screw them. How about standing on a principle and ramming it down MAGA throats? No. We're going to be a bunch of damn quizlings. And I like to say damn quizlings, but in this instance, it's damn quizlings. Those damn quizlings. Keys. 
All right. You know, we're kind of like in the fight for our lives. All right. No Christmas truces. I don't want a Christmas truce with MAGA. No such thing. What else is happening in the world? Hmm. Government shutdown. <laughs> yeah, let's shut down the government. And the people shutting down the government are the people who were actively involved on January 6th to violently overthrow the United States of America, which is kind of like stopping the government, shutting it down. And now they're in a legislative position, which I got to tell you, in academics, that makes it an insurgency. There's no loyal opposition. We're dealing with actual Confederate soldiers. And shall I say, you know, maybe under some indirect direction from Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because NRA Russian rubles wandered into U.S. dollars or a wash in Every single GOP treasury. Hmm. Do they continue to come here? I thought he's fighting a war and he's like losing his ass. Well, he hasn't sold his yacht yet. So it can't be too bad for him. He must still be paying some people here. He can afford it. Especially when the return is so grand. And now we have people in our in elected office actively working with a hostile foreign power to bring down the United States of America to a halt. Yeah, the media is never going to report it like that. Sounds so, I don't know, like conspiracy. Conspiracy. It's like a conspiracy. The conspiracies are touted as true. And then when you correct them, you are like a lunatic. Oh, I'm an alt-left lunatic, am I? I got to tell you, these people's grandparents, maybe even great-grandparents, I don't know, maybe, called Eisenhower a commie. Eisenhower a commie. All right, Joe Biden. He's a commie and a socialist and an international crime boss. I, it's just so astounding. Which is begs another question. They project so much, right? That's the question. <laughs> because I'm actually making a statement. I I I, I don't think. I really don't think that uh, Donald Trump is. An international crime boss running everything, you know, the octopus. Okay. He's a dupe at best. Well, I don't know. He's an asset. But I'm just saying that he's not really competent enough. Well, I don't know. He's had help. You think of all those 700 shell companies and LLCs. I was wondering how come... We were hearing about all these like shell companies that Joe Biden has. Joe Biden, I don't think Joe Biden has them. Okay, but maybe Hunter and some of the other families, whatever shell companies are, I think they were LLCs. You know, the typical type of you know, strategy that people use so that you're not held responsible for others' uh, liabilities. Mm -hmm. That's what a limited liability corporation is. When you take on partners... If that partner owes a bunch of money somewhere, they're not going to attach your company and an LLC with their, you know, to pay off their debt. That's what an LLC is. Okay, just saying. Okay, for Donald Trump to have over 700 so far that they found in some pretty unsavory places, shall we say. All right, we could go on more about all of that, but why don't we give you a rundown on what we have in store for you in the curated part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this fine Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Oh, I should note, as a reminder, 
My recipe for Metro Shrimp and Grits is uh, on the uh, Daily Co's uh, show notes and links diary. So rather involved. I have like friends in the uh, culinary industry who purport that you should only use no more than three ingredients. Well, that gets rid of a lot of sauciers, huh? You can make a good sauce with only three ingredients, but sometimes it's nice to build and layer flavors. But anyway, it's a little involved, but it's all there for you if you feel so inclined. All right, what do we have in store for you? Yeah, my boss Trump at the top is directing his soldiers to shut down the government. And uh, when I say Confederate MAGA Nazis, that's what I mean. On the rest of the menu, well, here's some interesting news. Nebraska is the latest Republican state to expand Medicaid to cover postpartum care for low-income mothers. Huh. The Biden administration made disaster assistance available to to Louisiana as salt water threatens the state's drinking water. Nice. And a Rhode Island community bank will pay $9 million to resolve discriminatory lending allegations. Yeah, they're bringing redlining back. Nice. After the break, we move to the chef's table where the Bulgarian parliament approved additional weapons to Ukraine. And the leader of Spain's conservatives failed in his long-shot first bid to become the country's next prime minister. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. homepage at natrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln and we thank Kelly for doing so Uh, across the page to the left from that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page and please do become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio it really does help And I'll let uh, Tom fill you in on some of the particulars a little bit later here during the break. But uh, it really does help us if you could become a recurring Patreon because the bills keep increasing. Oh, my God, they do. They never go down. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, yes, we're still there for now. Also on Mastodon, Spoutable, Blue Sky, etc., you can do so by going to at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom, and everything else that you do. Follow me on Twitter, Mastodon, Spoutable, Blue Sky, Tumblr, Instagram, Facebook, hell, wherever, at Justice Putnam, or simply as Justice Putnam. And I... Incidentally, post the show notes and links diary that I alluded to before, earlier, on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. And, of course, that's where you can find the uh, actual articles and clips, etc. And a few other entertaining tidbits as well. So you can find those Daily Co's diaries by following my social media feeds because the links are pretty well handy right there. Follow the show on Twitter. It's just a placement. We're going to, as I mentioned before, uh, activate it to a more, well, active account when we expand to these other social media platforms. But on the Twitter, you can find the show at Cookbook West. And please do pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, iTunes, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube. 
wherever podcasts can be found, but you're not going to find them on Stitcher because of Sirius XM. Damn you. Maybe I should stop saying that. Because if we're going to try to get into the block of being on Sirius XM, maybe we don't want them to hear that part. Okay. Well, we'll see. Anyway, <laughs> we're still looking into it. We've had uh, a few fan requests, listener requests, of uh, getting the block of David and uh, this show onto Sirius XM. I, you know, I'm not holding out great hope, but you never know. You never know. All right, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by staff at the Associated Press. They're hard workers. Lower income new mothers will get a full year of Medicaid health coverage in Nebraska under an order issued yesterday, Wednesday, by Republican Governor Jim Pillen. The move makes Nebraska the latest in a growing list of Republican-led states that had previously refused to expand postpartum Medicaid coverage beyond the minimum 60 days after women give birth. Conservatives are now largely embracing the charge as part of an anti-abortion agenda. In the wake of the U.S. Supreme Court ruling last year overturning Roe v. Wade, which for 50 years guaranteed a constitutional right to abortion. Yeah, you know, they go, oh, what? We now have to, like, be nice to them? Whoa, what? They can't have an abortion. They're going to have kids. Now we got to take care of the kids. These ghouls. Since that ruling, the Nebraska legislature enacted a 12-week abortion ban and... Hillen has promised to push for a six-week ban next year, you know, so quick that women don't even know if they're pregnant or not. Hmm, what's that all about? Well, at least they won't be uh, just left out in the cold for a while while they're depressed afterwards. Oh, God. State lawmakers passed a bill earlier this year to expand Medicaid's postpartum coverage to at least six months. Pillen said his order of a full year of coverage is a significant step in supporting Nebraska's mothers and children. Other states that have expanded the coverage this year while also enforcing strict abortion bans include Mississippi and Missouri. This decision ensures that nearly 5,000 mothers across our state will maintain access to a comprehensive range of behavioral and physical health services, Pillen said. Our children are the future of this state, and we are dedicated to providing the strongest possible support system to help them thrive. I suppose what they say out in Nebraska is what they say out in Kansas. Proof is in the pudding. Wine of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. President Joe Biden announced yesterday, Wednesday, that federal disaster assistance is available for Louisiana, which is working to slow a mass inflow of salt water creeping up the Mississippi River and threatening drinking water supplies in the southern part of the state. Biden's action authorizes the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Management Agency to coordinate all disaster relief efforts, according to a news release from the White House. Additionally, the declaration will allow for more equipment, resources, and federal money to address the saltwater intrusion. For the second year in a row, salt water from the Gulf of Mexico has moved further up the Mississippi, threatening drinking water in communities that rely on the river for fresh water. Typically, the river's mighty flow keeps mass amounts of salt water from reaching too far inland. But 
hot and dry conditions across the country this summer trigger drought that slowed the Mississippi's flow and lowered its water levels. In parts of the Plaquemines Parish, the southeast corner of Louisiana encompasses the final stretch of the Mississippi River before it reaches the Gulf of Mexico. Residents have relied on bottled water for cooking and drinking since June. Drinking water advisories have been issued for some communities in the parish, warning people the water is unsafe to drink, especially for people with kidney disease, high blood pressure, those on low-sodium diets, infants, and pregnant women. Now, the salt water is moving further upriver and will likely reach Orleans, St. Bernard, and Jefferson parishes by mid to late October, officials say. Bell Edwards uh, wrote to Biden earlier this week to ask for federal help. In his letter, Edwards said that the issue is of such severity and magnitude that state and local authorities can no longer manage it on their own. Federal assistance is necessary to save lives and to protect property, public health and safety, or to lessen or avert the threat of a disaster, the governor wrote. While officials say they are praying for rain to help increase the velocity of the drought-stricken river, they are also taking matters in, into their own hands. Raising the height of an underwater levee used to block or slow the salt water and bringing in 15 million gallons of fresh water to treatment facilities in impacted areas. Bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A community bank in Rhode Island agreed to pay $9 million to resolve allegations that it engaged in lending discrimination by redlining majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods, a U.S. attorney announced yesterday, Wednesday. A complaint accused Washington Trust Company of failing to provide mortgage lending services to majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods in Rhode Island from 2016 to 2021. The bank was founded in 1800 and, according to the Justice Department, is the oldest community bank in the nation. Washington Trust CEO Edward O. Ned Handy III said the bank vehemently denies the allegations. The bank entered into the agreement to avoid the expense and distraction of potential litigation and to allow the bank to focus fully on serving the needs of its customers and communities. That's a nice way of saying they got caught. We believe that we have been fully compliant with the letter and spirit of fair lending laws, and the agreement will further strengthen our focus on an area that has always been important to us, Handy said in a statement. Well, despite expanding across the Rhode Island, the bank never opened a branch in a majority black and Hispanic neighborhood, investigators said. It relied on mortgage loan officers working out of only majority white areas as the primary source of generating loan applications. The complaint also alleges that compared to Washington Trust over the same six year period, other banks received nearly four times as many loan applications each year in majority and majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods in the state. Everyone who pursues the American dream has the right to expect to be treated equally 
and with dignity regardless of their race, their background, or zip code, said Zachary Kuna, U.S. Attorney for the District of Rhode Island. As part of the settlement, the bank has agreed to a series of steps, including investing at least $7 million in a loan subsidy fund to increase access to home mortgage, home improvement, home refinance and home equity loans, and lines of credit for residents of majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods in the state. Well, well, well. And now that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Once there was a star. Just like everything in life, she reached the end of her regular star days when her heart, the core of her life, exhausted its fuel. But that was no end. She transformed into a supernova, and in the process, releasing a tremendous amount of energy. Okay, Jason, who and what am I listening to? This is Wanda Diaz-Merced. She's a blind astronomer and a pioneer in astronomical sonification. This is a TED Talk she gave about the massive explosions that stars release when they die. She's done a lot of work capturing these gamma ray bursts using sound rather than sight. Oh, so she's like the OG of astronomical sonification. Like, all of this, this entire series we're doing, stems from her and her work. Yeah, exactly. You're listening to Scientific American Science Quickly. I'm Jason Drakeford. And I'm Timmy Broderick. In the previous episode of this three-part fascination, we introduce you to scientists and musicians who are turning comets and galaxies and other stellar goodies into fascinating compositions. Today, we are telling you about the origins of this nascent field. So, Wanda... Yeah? I talked to her earlier this year. I mean, I'm in Paris working at the Astroparticle Cosmology Lab at the University of Paris. That is part of an institution called CERN, and I'm here in the lab. Yeah, so that's Wanda, and she works at the most famous particle accelerator in the world. But for all that she's accomplished, she's quite humble, and growing up in Puerto Rico, Wanda had a passion for science. I always wanted to, be, to become a scientist, but to me, the only scientists in the universe were medicine doctors, studying science meant that you would become a doctor. Wanda was diagnosed with diabetes pretty early in her childhood, and then later, diabetic retinopathy. This can cause blindness in people with diabetes. So when she was in her early 20s, in college, her vision started to go. The condition continued uh, deteriorating until the point when when I couldn't uh, orientate anymore. I needed help. I used to, like, stay in one only place the whole day and not move from there. Already I was using a cane. For most of Wanda's undergraduate years, she was focused on being a doctor, even though she was losing her sight, until one day her friend brought her into his backyard, where he had a small radio telescope as part of NASA's Radio Jove project. Uh, this is like, like an antenna that looks like, uh, like the wires for you to hang your clothes when you wash your clothes in the summer. So just imagine that, but made of copper wires. And, um, and a little bit fancier. Radio telescopes can detect radio emissions from several astronomical bodies, such as the Sun or Jupiter, which is a very fancy way of saying that Jupiter has radio storms, and we can literally hear them. Like, Jupiter has naturally occurring lasers near its poles that beam radio waves into space, which is wild, and sometimes we can catch them here on Earth. These pecks, pops, and crackling swishes are all what entranced Wanda in her friend's backyard. 
first I said, Emilio, said, Emilio, why are you listening to that? Because I thought it was an AM radio. And then he said, no, 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 Wandita, that is um, uh, waiting to see if there is any, any solar emissions. And then he says that my eyes got big, like my, my face changed. And I, yes, and I heard it. Yes, yes. It was this sense of possibility at that very moment. Then, at some point, he had to say, Wanda, you have to go to your house. You cannot stay here until tomorrow. Just sitting by that thing, listening to it. I didn't want to detach from it. And um, eh, I began pondering, what would it be to listen to the data? Hearing these Jovian emissions pushed Wanda into astronomy. She worked with Radio Jove Project and made her way to NASA and completed a PhD. Using sonifications, she's even made discoveries that sighted astronomers missed. Wanda found that star formation can affect supernova, which suggests that these explosions are not only dependent on the mass of their host star. Converting the data into sound helped uncover the drop in volume that led to the discovery. How, how do I say I discovered my ability to to listen to the to the data, to listen to the as you as you call it, and, and I love the way you call it, that to to listen to the to the universe, to the phenomena that happens in in the interstellar media. There's no textbooks available for us. A textbook in astrophysics is like gold dust. It's like a diamond. It's like platinum, a yellow diamond, the size of my fist. The scientific revolution developed in a way that just assumed that uh, we wouldn't participate. It's just the way it developed until it got to the point we had no ways. When I began, I didn't have any tools to, to perform in the field. No tools, nothing. Her work has inspired other blind astronomers, too. And my name is Enrique Pérez Montero. I have two names because, you know, in Spain we have two names. Enrique is an astrophysicist at the Institute of Astrophysics of Andalusia in Spain. He was not born blind, but a disease called retinitis pigmentosa has made his vision progressively cloudier. He could still see when he finished his PhD, but now, in his 40s, he continues to study the chemical compositions of the brightest galaxies. His workflow has changed, however. 10 or 15 years ago, I could, uh, I was able to see them directly in observatories and see their spectra and their images. And at the moment, I'm able to deal with uh, the numbers of the data and the telescope stack, just uh, listening in my computer these, these numbers. By using his computer to read out these data aloud, Enrique is able to lead a pretty normal life as an astrophysicist. But it's clear the field doesn't know how to react to his disability. Their discomfort is clear whenever Enrique goes to a scientific conference and other scientists see his guide dog, Rocco. Even though they are thought to be very intelligent because of the number of papers, of contributions, or the leaderships in projects, uh, they are mm, shocked uh, before the idea that uh, you are blind, that you are an astronomer. Enrique's disability even helps him analyze data without bias. Other astronomers are... Distracted by the beauty of the images. Mm -hmm. They can get wrong conclusions maybe because they are just seeing an image and they are not uh, objectively analyzing what's the content of the information. And this is one thing I can do because I'm just simply listening what is the trend of the data, of the very simple, cold data uh, read by my computer. How we choose to represent data can have far-reaching consequences. Astronomy has been associated with sight for centuries, but that does not mean the sense is necessary or even the most useful tool to do the job. 
It's ultimately arbitrary, Enrique says. Uh, 99% of the energy and the matter of the universe cannot be seen at all. <laughs> we can see them because people working with simulations is putting off this stuff about dark matter and dark energy. But of course, this cannot be seen at all. And we can translate it to other ways than images. Images are not the main source to, to get the information about what's the true nature of our universe. In the next and final episode of this series, we head overseas, where a multi-sensory astronomy festival takes over a small Italian town. Astronomical sonification is a very cool concept, but can it actually inspire people? I believe that nature has its own sounds, and listening to that sound was um, as if that galaxy was telling something to me. It, it was like this galaxy was describing itself uh, to me. Science Quickly is produced by Jeff Del Dizio, Talika Bose, Kelso Harper, and Karen Leon. Our theme music was composed by Dominic Smith. Juana Diaz Merced and Matt Russo provided the sonifications you heard in this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Science Quickly wherever you get your podcasts. For more in depth science news and features, go to scientificamerican.com. And if you like the show, give us a rating or a review. For Scientific American Science Quickly, I'm Jason Drakeford. And I'm Timmy Braddock. See you next time. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. Netrootsradio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Get your band books here. Get your band books. Listen up. This matters. I'm Lewis Black, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. In the small western Massachusetts city of Northampton, of the 21,000 books donated to the September 2023 League of Women Voters book sale, more than 1,000 titles shared, as the local newspaper put it, quote, the distinction of at some point having been banned or challenged in libraries and school districts across America. Books like To Kill a Mockingbird, The Hunger Games, A Farewell to Arms, The Sun Also Rises, Charlotte's Web, Where's Waldo? And the Harry Potter series, which may strike you as just plain goofy. But sadly, there's nothing funny here. Censorship across this country is deadly serious. The Florida Department of Education has announced the recent removal of over 300 titles, and Texas school districts have banned more than 800 books. Books that deal with gender identity, LGBTQ themes, and race are the ones most targeted by censors. To bring its display of banned books up to date, the League of Women Voters purchased the recently targeted Maya Kababi's Gender Queer and George M. Johnson's All Boys Aren't Blue. One irony here, the book sale raises money for the League of Women Voters and its work protecting the right to vote. Another fundamental right under attack in the United States right now. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the American Civil Liberties Union because freedom can't defend itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Would you be willing to stand up in solidarity with your fellow workers, even if it cost you your job? Well, on this day in labor history, the workers at Mercy Docks and Harbor Company in Liverpool, England, answered that question. The year was 1995. 329 Mercy dock workers refused to cross a picket line that was being walked against another company on the docks. The workers at Torside had been fired for protesting against erosions in job security and increasingly unpredictable scheduling. They were speaking out against the casualization of their labor. When the Mersey dock workers would not cross the Torside picket line, they too were fired. 
dock workers across the world stood up in solidarity with the Mersey workers against this unjust treatment. They knew if it could happen in Liverpool, it might happen anywhere. Pickets sprung up from Norway to Japan, from Australia to Italy, and into the United States. It was a global outpouring of solidarity. The strike wore on for 850 days. One year into the strike, dock workers held an international day of action in support of the Liverpool workers. Finally, two and a half years after they were fired, the dock workers agreed to a settlement. They did not get their jobs back, but they did get severance pay. A film was made about the struggle. The proceeds were used to purchase a bar in Liverpool. It is known as the Dockers Pub and has become a space for working class organizing. The International Dock Workers Council was also born from this strike. Today, the council has 90,000 members, a lasting movement of solidarity. 20 years after the strike, dock workers from across the world gathered in Liverpool to remember the struggle. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 44 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs of around 70. We currently have foggy conditions, but we'll have have some clouds later on this morning giving way to generally sunny skies in the afternoon and winds will be light and variable throughout the day partly partly cloudy skies this evening and then increasing clouds with periods of showers late lows will be around 50 with winds light and variable and then overcast with rain showers tomorrow Highs in the low 60s, winds light and variable, and it looks like we're going to get a quarter to a half inch of rain, and then some drying out for a bit of time after that. Ragweed pollen is rated high here in the little village of Rogue River, Oregon. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 15 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is moderate at level 5. I would still take care. Barometric pressure is falling, falling, falling from 30.17 inches. Visibility currently is much less than a half mile. And relative humidity is at 99%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. And that makes up the weather underground. London is 66 degrees and cloudy. Paris, or Paris, is 74 and sunny. Rome is 84 and sunny. Kabul is 60 and mostly cloudy. Kiev is 75 degrees and sunny. Hong Kong is 84 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 80 degrees and fair. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 54 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 58 and fair. Chicago, Illinois is 66 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 60 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is Weather from Around the World, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world.
staff at the World Desk at the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Bulgaria's parliament yesterday, Wednesday, approved the provision of additional military aid to Ukraine in its war with Russia. At a closed-door meeting, lawmakers voted 141 to 40 with three abstentions in favor of supplying Ukraine with defective service-to-air missiles for the Russian-made S-300 air defense system and small-caliber automatic weapon ammunition discarded by the Interior Ministry. What? Military experts said the missiles cannot be repaired in Bulgaria— But Ukraine has the needed facilities to fix them or use them for spare parts. Okay, I see. The chief of defense, Admiral Emil Eftimov, assured lawmakers that the provided weapons do not harm Bulgaria's defensive capabilities. We have no intention of giving Ukraine the entire S-300 missile complex until we find a replacement capability, he said. The vote mirrored divisions in the Balkan country over sending military aid to Ukraine. It sparked criticism from the Socialist Party and the pro-Russian nationalists from the Revival Party who voted against sending the aid. Bulgaria, which joined NATO in 2004, still maintains stocks of Soviet-designed weapons and has numerous factories making munitions for them. Je te donne mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Joseph Wilson and Paul White of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The leader of Spain's conservatives failed yesterday, Wednesday, in his long shot first bid to become the country's next prime minister when he fell short of the votes he needed in the Spanish parliament to form a government. As expected, popular party leader Alberto Nunez Feyu came up four votes shy of the necessary absolute majority of 176 votes in his favor. Feyu will try again on Friday tomorrow when the bar is lowered and he needs only more yes than no votes from Parliament's 350 lawmakers. The popular party holds 137 seats in the Madrid-based Congress of the Deputies, the most of any party. But even with backing from the far-right Vox's 33 lawmakers and two from small conservative parties representing Navarra and the Canary Islands, Feyu only reached 172 votes in his favor to 178 against. Spain's July 23rd national election left the parliament highly fragmented with its legislators spread between 11 different parties, setting the stage for a difficult path to power for any party. If Feyu fails to win approval on his second attempt, acting Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez would get a shot at staying in the Monclo Palace. The center-left socialist leader would have to round Round up enough support of lawmakers from a group of competing leftist, regionalist, and separatist parties from Catalonia and the Basque Country. The Parliament debated Feyu's bid to become Prime Minister for several hours on Tuesday and then yesterday morning Wednesday before the vote. 
The debate, however, was dominated by the possibility that Sanchez is considering accepting demands from Catalan separatist parties that Spain grant an amnesty for hundreds, possibly thousands of people who participated in a failed 2017 secession bid by Northeast Catalonia. Sanchez, who has pardoned several high-level Catalan Catalan separatists, has kept quiet on the possibility of an amnesty and only said that he wants to continue normalizing relations with the Northeast region where tensions have decreased in recent years. But leading Catalan separatists have said the amnesty is a real possibility, while also upping the ante by saying that an authorized referendum on independence should be granted by Sanchez if he wants to maintain their support during a theoretical new term. If no government is formed before November 27th, the parliament will be dissolved and a new election called for January 14th. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for the Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver